Virtual fencing is an emerging and rapidly developing technology that shows a lot of promise as a land management tool, and land managers across the globe are asking questions. In February of 2023, participants of a nationwide virtual fence working group consisting of university faculty, state and federal agencies, industry representatives, nonprofits, and producers all made their way to Boise, Idaho to talk about virtual fence technology. The Virtual Fence Working Group in Service Meeting was funded by the USDA NIFA Genome to Phenome Initiative. Virtual fencing is, is a, a, almost like a game-changing technology for range management. Um, but in its infancy, there's a lot of lessons to be learned and a lot of knowledge to be shared as we're, as we're implementing these technologies at scale. So the Virtual Fence Working Group was formed uh, a couple years ago as just an opportunity for multiple different researchers and organizations that are working with virtual fence technology to help share you know, some of our findings, help share some of the troubleshooting things that we've come up with over the years. Uh, really just as a forum to be able to get together as a bigger group and share some of our common knowledge that we have. And we all have our individual research projects that we're working on, maybe our own extension programs that we're running. Uh, but from a bigger sense, as we implement this technology across the Western United States, there's really an opportunity to, to leverage all this information and data we're collecting to answer new and interesting questions about how livestock interact and improve rangeland. And we were uh, discussing some of the bigger challenges we were having, things like uh, how do we acquire and process data efficiently? How do we talk about virtual fence systems? And how do we standardize some of the terms that are related to those? As well as how do we roll out different tutorials for, for different stakeholders, things like agency folks, uh, producers, et cetera. And through our collective knowledge that we had, we really saw an opportunity to be able to bring people together and really try and hammer out some of these issues. This is our first in-person meeting that we've had and had that opportunity to get together as a group really over two days. This weekend here, we wanted to meet other people and learn and <laughs> see what other people are doing. We're looking at close to 3,000 head of cattle. We're working with nine producers. We have a very large scope, so we're looking at things in a very large context. But what's cool coming here, because our, the scope of our project is so different from everybody else who presented here, is seeing what people are looking at in the minute. How livestock utilize the technology, uh, how does it apply it across different classes, how does this affect you know, livestock distribution across the West as a whole. Virtual fence technology is, is a pretty new technology. It's novel, it's really developing rapidly. And you can imagine that with as many different people across the country, even across the world, that are interested in, in using this technology. Uh, everybody's coming up with, with their own terms and jargon and slang that's, uh, that's kind of unique to, to how they think about fencing. And we felt like helping define new terminology would not only help collaboration, but would just uh, make for better communication among scientists, even among reviewers as they're reviewing papers to understand what, what everybody's talking about. So as an extension outreach specialist, I regularly need to communicate about scientific discoveries and emerging technologies with diverse audiences. And having terms that the scientific community agrees upon and consistently uses is really the first step in being able to effectively communicate about virtual fencing with broader audiences. Terminology is, is one of the things that is a challenge. Another one that we run into uh, very similarly is like data standardization, getting people to agree on what is the appropriate way to process data. Uh, how do we identify whether data is good data or bad data? What are the metrics that we use to, uh, to do that? Right now, there's virtual fence collars on thousands of animals across the Western United States. And so really it's an opportunity to, to how do we leverage this unprecedented amount of data that's being collected to answer you know, scientific important questions. Most of my work has been focused on developing data processing methodology. So that included uh, working with engineers at Vents to understand what was really in the data and what we could potentially do with that. Initially, a couple of years ago, when we were first getting the data from Vents, they were sharing raw CSV files. And I had to find a way to extract the data from those files 
and then develop a database schema that would allow for convenient storage and processing. Yeah, so we've worked um, pretty collaboratively with Vents to design a system to get our data uh, more efficiently and faster. It allows us as researchers to get what we need without bothering the engineers. <laughs> I ended up using a SQLite database which has the benefit of you know, being a single file and integrates quite seamlessly with both R and Python. What we do is we take data and we turn it into results, interpret those results. And there's you know, many steps to get from A to Z in that data processing pipeline. And that kind of that middle portion is kind of all of the cleanup work, the data processing. And many of these organizations and institutions we all share that commonality. And when you have a standardized data format, we all can go from A to Z quicker. You can generate more questions, get results for those questions, and the scientific process itself speeds up. Forming this collaboration was an important first step in sharing all the lessons learned about this technology among the scientific community. The next step is making this information readily available to the public or anyone interested in using virtual fencing. When doing this, it's important to pay attention to how people prefer to consume information. And what we found is that short length videos are one of the most palatable and therefore accessed forms of information sharing. So much is being learned about virtual fence technology by researchers and early adopters across the nation, even across the globe. Um, but there's a communication gap between researchers and broader audiences. Um, my involvement with the collaboration has been putting together easy to understand outreach content, primarily in the form of informational videos. I've broken down what my process looks like in the production of these videos um, from start to finish and shared it here with the Virtual Fence Working Group. See this workshop hopefully is you know, step number two in this process of where does this group go from here? Virtual meeting, meeting in person, and then what are we, this is the catalyst hopefully for what are some of these bigger problems or bigger questions that we can start tackling. So, um, I'd really like to highlight the SDSU Jackrabbits, go Jacks, <laughs> and your face spicing. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I, I, I guess, uh, <laughs> make sure that gets in the cut. And let me know if my hair is a mess or I look like shit. Yeah, I don't have broccoli in my teeth, do I? Blah, 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 blah. Messed up that one. <laughs> <laughs>